My first novel came out in 2004, so I haven't been doing this very long, and I started doing it because I loathed my previous job with such passion that I would rather have you know, bored a hole in my head than stay doing it one week longer. Uh, it was a very ed educational job, uh, um, public PR, you know, spin doctoring, polit uh, political spin doctoring. But I thought, you know, let's give it a go. I did a business plan and uh, the rest is history. And here we are five years later <laughs> and 18, 19, 20 books later. So it's been pretty packed. When I start on a book, uh, I actually come up with, with the ideas. Asfo Fields at the time, although there was something in the Story Bible, uh, Epic said, well, what, what do you think it is? And I said, well, you know, let me look at some campaigns and it has to be something, uh, it has to be something quite, quite dramatic and it has to be something pivotal for the war to make the various sacrifices and, and awards worth, worthwhile. And I'm... I'm a sort of keen student of World World War Two, and there were some amazing World War Two commando raids, um, like the like the raid on uh, Saint Nazaire, which, frankly, when I looked at it, when I went through the history books and reminded myself how impossible that real raid was, you couldn't do it in fiction. No editor would believe that human beings could do it. It was that over the top. It, it was beyond gears. So I sort of racked it back a bit into what was believable fiction because re real life doesn't necessarily make good fiction. Real life doesn't have to make sense but fiction does because it's a construct. So I came up with what I thought the Battle of Asfo Fields was and who the characters were involved in it and why it was significant and that's when you see the, the backstory for Aunt Anya with her, with her gung-ho Patton-esque mother who is this larger than life character that little Anya is trying to live up to and you find out about the Santiago brothers and uh, that just tumbled out of the, of, of, of the actual battle. Uh, for the present day stuff, well, it's, it's actually much easier because, for that because with Asphalt Fields I knew that I had to bridge game one to two. So I knew I had a start and an end point. So that's much easier for me to fill in. But uh, so it, in, in some ways I, I, I actually had part of the menu from Epic because I know what the game said. But Epic's always been very good about saying, well, what do you think happened? You know add to this and that's quite nice because I feel that I'm adding to the fabric of, of, the, of, of the whole story, the whole franchise and not just sidelined into the books that are the, the other bits, is that one, one does shape the other, which is very rewarding for a writer. One of the things about writing a, a book is that when you've written it, certainly for me, I can't see it for what it is, you know, too, you know, too, many, too many trees and all that sort of thing, and uh, I have to read it cold, and I've forgotten I've written it. I've often forgotten what's in it as well, but that's another thing. Uh, I've actually forgotten I've written it, so when I go back to Aspho Fields, I'm actually struck by things that I like, that I didn't even know I liked when I was doing it. It's because it's like, I, you know, this is a book and I, and, I, and I didn't write it. It's a very odd feeling, you know. Um, what I liked writing at the time, which was exploring the relationships between the characters, when I actually read the book, my, I tended to find my favourite bits were the, uh, were the flashbacks. Because watching them training and watching Dom gradually just deciding who he was and becoming this, this sort of knife-wielding commando was... I actually liked that and I'd, and I'd sort of forgotten where it went and I was carried along with it and I realised I was still reading, you know. It's really sad when a writer can only read their own stuff and won't read the book. But yeah, I mean, I might as well be on, on, honest about it. It's a totally different process for me. So the other thing I really enjoyed about Asfo Fields was uh, exploring the relationship between Hoffman and Marcus because I didn't think they hated each other. I mean, they're, clearly there's friction, but it's more born of bewilderment because they both knew each other as on honourable men and they'd both been heroes and suddenly have this massive falling out. And I know Mike Capps has said in an interview it was just one of those things that just happened and nobody thought it through for the game. Actually, it was the biggest gift I could have been given because it was like, yeah, but I know why he left him to die in the jail. Or presumably left him to die. Because, and you could see Hoffman going, why did I do that? Why did I just react like that? When all this man has done and all, and all we've been in the past, we, we're, we're the same regiment. And it actually sets up all those guilt things because Hoffman is all guilt. So that, that was a really nice bit. And I'm really, you know, sometimes you get these you get these real breaks in the most odd places and they come out of nowhere.
It's the temptation to overrun the actual continuity. One thing I've learned from other franchises is don't add what you don't need to. Don't add detail you don't need to. If it doesn't drive the, the, the actual story at that point, don't commit yourself to times, dates, technology, anything like that. So I've been very sparing. I've also been very sparing about adding what we call OCs, original characters, in the time world. Because in other franchises, I've done entire series with casts that are, in, that are all my original characters for, for various reasons. But with this, I've been very sparing. I want to keep it down to a small number of characters as close to the books. When I've added new characters like Bernie and, and Padrick, it's been for a real specific reason, because I've needed them as devices in the stories. Like I've, I've needed someone who was around at a certain time but has been separated. Uh, I've needed someone who would give some background to the other characters. So they're only there when they absolutely have to be, because there's nothing worse than, than sort of proliferating. So I'm also trying to reuse characters from the comics to make sure that we're that meshed. I mean, that's the joy about doing Gears, is that it's such a small creative team by comparison with other fran franchises, and we all talk to each other and we talk to each other regularly. It's not a matter of just getting a piece of paper saying, well, well this happens to fit it in. It's like, I'm, I'm doing this, Does that, you know, how's it going to affect you? What about this? Can I, can I lift this from you? And that's a fantastically stimulating collaborative process. And that, that is the real joy of it. I mean, people say to me, well, why do, you, why do you do this? Why do you write books? You don't read books. You don't like reading. You don't play games, and that's not because I don't like games, it's because of the constraint. But why do you do this? Why do you produce something you don't consume? Because of the joy of producing it. It's like, why do people knit baby clothes when they're adults? It's because it's fun and they want to do this and they want to share that with the user. And, you know, I, I get enormous pleasure out of Gears. Uh, my, my friends tell me they, they actually know work when I'm in one of my Gears schedule phases because they say, your mood's lifted, Karen, you must, you must be chainsawing. Because it's just, yeah, you, know, you don't know what the next day is going to bring in, in terms of the, the, the sort of ideas you're going to get coming back in or what will strike you when you're writing. It's just, it's just a lovely, joyous thing to get your coffee, sit down, fire up the PC and go, yeah, Gears, fabulous.